Welcome back to another YouTube video. It's your tutor, Disha. Today, I'll be working the Kate Biology Unit 2, 2021, June Paper 2 questions. Let's get right into it. Starting with Module 1, which speaks to bioenergetics. Question 1A reads, an experiment observed the interconversions of compounds found in the nitrogen cycle was carried out by students. 150 centimeters cube of a solution of urea was mixed with 50 grams of a well aerated loam soil. The ammonium, nitrite, and nitrate concentrations were immediately determined semi-quantitatively by using test strips that produce color changes. The strips were compared to the specific color scale, which gave a measurement of the ion in parts per million. The mixture was sampled for both ions in six-hour intervals for 24 hours. Figure 1 is a graph which represents the changes of the ammonium and nitrate ions in the mixture over the 24-hour period. Here is figure 1 production of ammonium and nitrate ions over a 24-hour incubation period in loam with a solution of urea. And the corresponding question asks to construct a table to represent the data given in the figure. So all you'd have to do, guys, is extract the data from the graph. Here is my table. And I want you to always remember to include a title. The title is one mark. Moving on. A diagram of a simplified nitrogen cycle involving plants in a natural ecosystem is shown in figure two. Identify the processes labeled A to E in figure two. So the first thing you should ask yourself is what is the nitrogen cycle? Well, the nitrogen cycle is the cycling of nitrogen through living and non-living things in the ecosystem. Then you should be thinking about the different processes of the nitrogen cycle. There is decomposition in which microorganisms break down dead compounds. There is ammonification, which these dead compounds or waste from animals are transformed into ammonia. There's nitrification in which the ammonia from um, ammonification is transformed into nitrates. There is denitrification, D meaning you're losing a nitrogen. So we would say that denitrification reduces nitrates to nitrites, to nitrogen gas. There is nitrogen fixation. So recall most of the nitrogen in our atmosphere is inert. Um, we cannot just use it in, or in the elemental form. So what happens is either you have atmospheric fixation by lightning or you have biological fixation in the root nodule of leguminous plants or you have industrial fixation. All right, so since we now know the processes of the nitrogen cycle, we can begin to label it. So therefore, Living plants going to organic nitrogen in the soil is definitely decomposition. Organic nitrogen going to ammonia here is ammonification. Ammonia going to nitrates is nitrification. Nitrates going to nitrogen in the air is denitrification. And nitrogen going to the living plants is nitrogen fixation. Part three, animals may also be involved in the nitrogen cycle. Extend the diagram in figure two to illustrate the involvement of animals in the nitrogen cycle. So here is my drawing. And this is my cow, her name is Molly, and this is her friend, Chikina. And as you can see in this nitrogen cycle, um, Molly and Chikina, they are very important because they're excreting waste, right? And these wastes can be transformed into ammonia, which can be transformed into nitrates. And also when you are producing a drawing, ensure to place a title there. The title is worth one mark. So for drawings, titles go below the figure. Part B Energy is needed to metabolize nitrogen compounds within organisms. 
under anaerobic conditions, the respiratory pathway differs depending on the organism. Stay two similarities between fermentation, which is anaerobic respiration, reactions in animals and yeast. So the first thing you should be asking yourself is what is fermentation? So fermentation is an anaerobic pathway where a substrate, most likely glucose, is broken down. All right, so for the similarities, we could start with the obvious here in that for fermentation in animals and yeast, it occurs in the absence of oxygen. Secondly, they share a similar substrate, which is glucose. Thirdly, you could talk about the fact that it is glycolysis that initiates the fermentation reaction. And there's also ATP be pro being produced in both processes, right? And lastly, you could also talk about the fact that the cytoplasm is the site for both fermentation in animals and yeast. Next, Explain the function of the fermentation reactions in organisms. Fermentation allow organisms to continue to undergo metabolic reactions even if oxygen is used up, right? Or it is unavailable. Even though you're going to have a buildup of lactic acid, at least we have energy to continue our biochemical reactions. Oxygen can be paid back. Fermentation is important because it removes electrons and hydrogen ions from NADH during glycolysis. Guys, I'm trusting that you have mastered the concept of cellular respiration and ATP synthesis. And if you did, you'd have a greater appreciation for this. And you would have seen here that this regenerates NAD and other electron carriers to continue glycolysis. Thirdly, um, we can deviate from animals a little bit to talk about the importance of fermentation economically. For example, in yeast, you know, yeast is used to make bread and alcohol, and it is because of their fermentation reactions that results in the bread being raised and the alcohol being produced. Next, the process of oxidative phosphorylation is very important for the supply of respiratory energy under aerobic conditions. Discuss the importance of the following components of oxidative phosphorylation for 12 marks. All right, so this is three. I'd like to think that each of these would be worth four marks. The first one, the formation of a proton gradient. The second one, the synthesis of ATP. The third one, the role of oxygen. All right, let's begin to talk about some of the points that we would include in our discussion. Okay, so the first thing that you need to include in the discussion is a proper definition for oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation is the oxidation of the high energy electron carriers. What were the high energy electron carriers again? Good job. NADH and FADH, right? And we know that oxidation is the loss of electrons, right? So those hydrogens on the NADH and FADH are going to be oxidized. And these two important electron carriers, they, they deliver the electrons to the electron transport chains. And recall that a gradient is created when protons are moved from the matrix into to the inner membrane space. So how is this important? It is the formation of the proton gradient that provides the source of energy used to drive the phosphorylation of ADP to ATP. Now for the importance of the synthesis of ATP, you can include how important ATP is to power metabolic processes and also a big thing here to signal glycolysis to stop. It's like a negative feedback. You know, when ATP is produced, glycolysis is slowed because that would indicate that the cell has enough energy. Oxygen is used as the final electron acceptor. Number two, Figure three shows a motor neuron in the spinal cord of an ox from a light micrograph. All right, take a minute to look at the motor neuron here. Can I ask you guys, what is a motor neuron? I said that the motor neuron 
or efferent neuron is that neuron transmit impulses from the spinal cord to the skeletal and smooth muscles. Here in the space below, construct an annotated diagram of the motor neuron provided in figure three and show the magnification of your drawing. Here is my drawing of the motor neuron. I've also attached my magnification. You know, for biology drawings, we label to the right and the title is placed below the drawing. And I have also placed my annotations there. Next part, state two main functions of synapses. Synapse, we're just stating here and I've placed three for the transmission of impulses. Number two, integration of impulses and number three, it plays a role in the formation of memories. Part three, outline the sequence of events that occurs when an action potential reaches a synapse. Now, to get a full understanding of the sequence of events, it's imperative that we touch on the anatomy of the neuron. The space between two neurons is called a synapse. The neuron preceding the synapse is called the presynaptic neuron. The neuron preceding the synaptic cleft is called the presynaptic neuron, while the neuron that comes after the synaptic cleft is called the postsynaptic neuron. And if you want to know more about neuronal biology, be sure to click the link in the description on my introduction to the nervous system. Neurotransmitter is a chemical that can excite or inhibit a target neuron and they are stored in vesicles at the end of the presynaptic neuron when the neuron is at rest. So action potentials, they can't cross into the synaptic cleft. What happens is that the message must be changed from electrical format to chemical format. To do this, there is a cascade of events. Once the action potential arrives at the presynaptic neuron, it's going to depolarize the membrane. Depolarization results in the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. These channels are going to allow calcium to come into the presynaptic neuron. Once calcium enters the presynaptic neuron, it's going to force the vesicles with the neurotransmitters to fuse with the membrane, which results in the release of these neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. Once the neurotransmitters are in the synaptic cleft, what they're going to do is they're going to diffuse to the postsynaptic neuron. Once they bind to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron, that's going to initiate an action potential in that postsynaptic neuron. But remember, the cells in the body, they're all about conserving energy. What's going to happen is that the neurotransmitters are going to be degraded enzymatically. Part B, Plant process co-transporter proteins within cell membranes that move two molecules at the same time. One molecule is transported along or down its concentration gradient, which releases energy that is used to transport the other molecule against its concentration gradient. Part one, differentiate between the source and sink in relation to phloem transport. So the source is the area where the plants produce their food during photosynthesis, while the sink is the area where the plant stores or use the produced food. So with these definitions, can you think about examples of sources or sinks? So you could say that the leaf is an example of a source and the root or buds are examples of sink. All right. Part two, explain how the sieve elements of phloem are loaded with solutes against a concentration gradient. Look at the key here. It's loaded with solutes against a concentration gradient. Right there, you should be thinking about active transport. Active transport specifically in the companion cells, right? Because that's where the active transport occurs. Recall at the beginning of the question, they spoke about a co-transporter molecule. That was them giving you the clue to the answer here, right? So 
Sucrose, along with protons, they are carried through a co-transporter protein, right, into the companion cells. Once it gets into the companion cells, remember now the companion cells are annexed to the sieve elements, right? And sucrose is going to be in a high concentration in the companion cells and low concentration in the xylem. So what's going to happen is that sucrose is going to diffuse from the companion cell into the sieve elements through the plasma desmata. Part C, figure four shows the movement of substances through the phloem and the xylem. And the corresponding question here says, discuss the mass flow theory as a mechanism of sugar transport in the phloem. Your response must include the processes labeled 1 to 7 and the movement of substances as indicated by arrows. And so to initiate your discussion, what you would do is to provide a suitable definition for the mass flow theory. What was that theory all about? So recall the mass flow theory was an hypothesis postulated by Ernst Munch that demonstrated how molecules flow under pressure from the source to the sink. And from the previous question, we're abreast on what is a source and a sink. So right there and then we should be thinking about how the sucrose is actively loaded into the sieve element, right? Because of sucrose being loaded here, water is going to diffuse from the xylem into the sieve element. Now with water and sucrose here now, that's going to create a higher hydrostatic pressure than the sink area here. And this pressure is going to drive the translocation of molecules. At the sink area, we're seeing that sucrose is unloaded, right? Whether actively or passively, it's unloaded to root cells or sink structures for usage or storage, right? What we're also noticing here at six is water being moved back into the xylem by a diffusion and what's happening to the water molecules. They're being pulled up by what process? Transpiration, right? Transpirational pull. You notice here water is coming in from the soil here. This could be osmosis. In either case, the molecules are being pulled up so that what? Some of the water can also enter the sieve element again to cause another translocation. Or you can see some of the water being evaporated. All right, moving on to module three, applications of biology. Number three A. Monoclonal antibodies are used in the early testing for pregnancy. Figure three shows a strip from a home pregnancy test kit. There are three areas in each strip where reactions occur. To take a minute to examine this home pregnancy test strip, right? We're seeing a urine sample and three areas. And the first part says, define the term monoclonal antibody. Monoclonal antibodies are clones of antibodies, as the name suggests. They are made to serve as substitute antibodies that can restore or enhance the immune system's attack on cells that aren't wanted. Moving on, we're seeing another figure here. Look at the key, and they're showing how these structures in the key interact with each other at the various reactions here, A, B, and C. And they're saying, identify the areas labeled one to three on figure five, where reactions A, B, and C in figure six occur. Okay, let's go back to figure five. So for one here, contains monoclonal antibodies made in mouse, I would say that it is reaction B, Right, it is reaction B with the HCG molecule. Remember, the HCG will be in the urine if the woman is pregnant. So that means at one, you'd have the HCG molecule binding to the monoclonal antibody with the enzyme to activate the dye, right? Because remember, you normally can see the colors in two and three. 
two, I would say this is reaction C, right? And then for three, this is reaction A because the anti-mouse antibody is always at the control region here. Part three is the control region. And then three says, outline the processes which would occur in each labeled area in figure five if the pregnancy test is positive. So recall once the pregnancy strip is dipped into the urine, the urine is going to be pulled up by capillary action. It will go at one first and at one you will have the HCG, right, which is the hormone that is produced by the pregnant woman. It's going to bind to the to the monoclonal antibodies here. The ATG molecules that have combined with the mobile antibodies, what they're going to do is bind to another set of antibodies. As it says here, it contains different types of antibodies and die. If the woman is pregnant, there's going to be a blue line indicating that HCG is present in the urine. The urine is going to move from two and move to this area here. We call here the control region. So what's going to happen is that the monoclonal antibodies compatible with the anti-HCG antibodies will bind to it and trigger a second color change. Part B, research has shown that maternal smoking has harmful effects on fetal and infant health. Table one shows the cigarette smoking habits of a group of pregnant women in the United States of America in 2014 based on age and level of education. Table one, cigarette smoking habits of pregnant women in the United States of America in 2014. On the grid provided, construct a bar graph based on the data provided in the table. Here is my bar graph. For five marks, ensure that you have a title. You need to have a representative title. You need to ensure that your bars are labeled and your axes too. Use a different shade because you'd be using pencils to so use a different shade or grid to indicate which bar belongs to which cohort. Part two, state two conclusions which can be drawn from the data in table one. So based on the data in table one, we can conclude that for maternal ladies with bachelor's degree or higher, they are less prone to smoke cigarette, right, during pregnancy. They also had the highest prevalence of quitting during pregnancy too, while for ladies with less than high school education, they had the lowest prevalence, right, of smoking cigarettes during, at any time during pregnancy. All right, part three, suggest one measure that would be effective in reducing the prevalence of cigarette smoking. So I would comment on the government's role here in that the government can implement campaigns especially in the communities, using graphic media, right? Or even social media, right? And through these platforms, they can, you know, use those commanding pictures that shows the negative effects of cigarette smoking to change the beliefs and the attitudes of the people in that area. And while they're doing that, to make this measure more effective, what they can do is also um, implement free counseling and free resources, right? On how to stop smoking, on how to find other recreational activities that can replace smoking instances. And we're at the last question. I'm so happy, right? It's... 2 a.m. in the morning and I need a cup of coffee and I'm so tired. Nicotine is a drug which is present in cigarette smoke. Cigarette smoking can lead to the development of chronic diseases. Discuss three ways in which nicotine in cigarette smoke can lead to the development of cardiovascular diseases. All right, for 12 marks here, Again, we're coining a beautiful discussion, starting with 
commenting on what is nicotine, right? So nicotine is a stimulant and we know that a stimulant is a type of drug that, you know, stimulates the nervous system. So it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system resulting in adrenaline released from adrenal glands. So what are different cardiovascular diseases that can arise from this? You can include in your discussion hypertension, yes, coronary heart diseases because the nicotine drug, it also makes the blood more viscous. All right, guys, you can also talk about arteriosclerosis. I'm so sorry. I wrote here atherosclerosis. All right, guys, thanks so much for, you know, going through it with me. And I wish you all the best in your unit two examination and see you at my webinars. Bye.